Welcome to the Story Powers Podcast, the show about the power of stories, the people who tell them, and why you should be doing it too. I'm your host, keynote speaker and storytelling coach, Francisco Mafus. My guest today is Ravi Rajani. After many years in sales and investment banking, Ravi has made it his mission to help elite consultants craft and deliver their signature story in a way that connects and converts, and he has been featured on ITV and BBC Radio. Ravi is also technically one of my competitors as the LinkedIn story guy, and that's probably why he's been dodging me as a podcast guest for absolute ages. I get it, he was trying to keep me from stealing his trade secrets without being rude. But today, he made a mistake. He messaged me and said, it's probably very last minute, and I know how much you like to carefully prepare for your podcast, but any chance we can record this afternoon? So I called his bluff, and here we are. Ladies and gentlemen, Ravi Rajani. Ravi, welcome to the show. What's happening, brother? What's happening, brother? What's going on, man? <laughs> Listen, dude, I love I love the intro, but it's really interesting when we talk about competition, man, because every time, you know, LinkedIn's a huge place, etc. There's so many people doing the same thing at us. But I think you'll agree with this, is that I I once got taught this and I've embodied this ever since, which is every message needs a different messenger. A dude called Yaya Bakar taught me that. And I'm like, man, it's it's so important in the world we live in today, man. And it's good that we're talking about stories. So let's go. Let's make it happen. Yeah, there is that other commercial effect or, or, or phenomenon, which is that, you know, if you if you want to buy, so a lot of cities have this, and I'm, I'm sure London does that. I remember from my time there. But if you want yeah. to buy, you know, a, a bespoke suit, Right. You go to Savile Row, which is the place where you buy a bespoke suit. And there's plenty of shops there that sell bespoke suits. What you don't do is try to, and if you want to open a shop that sells bespoke suits, you don't try and go as far away from Savile Row as possible mm. because you want people looking for bespoke suits to find you. So I think the idea that you would want, like I heard people complain, saying, oh, you know, you shouldn't connect to, you, to whoever does similar things to you. So right, you shouldn't engage with them, and it's 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 not because, I, and I've said this to people like anyone who likes you and feel and resonates with you is probably unlikely to resonate with me the same way because we have very different styles. So I think it's crazy to have like oh, he's a story guy. Stay away from them. Let's not, let no one else find out that it exists. Dude, you're so it's such a for me. My perspective is it's such a scarcity mindset when somebody operates in that way, where they're never truly going to be able to show up as themselves. And also they're never going to be able to serve at a high level if they've got that mindset. So I'm with you, brother. I'm with you on that. Right. So what do then school investment banking and coconuts have in common? 30 <laughs> seconds, go. Dude, when I was growing up, see, my father was born in Malawi and my mum was born in Tanzania. And they came here when they were in their teens. And growing up, man, they what I was watching when I was younger was my father being very successful in corporate at a very early age, man. So for me, growing up, I was like, well, that's that was the standard route. That was all that was all I thought about. I never thought that the path of entrepreneurship would be one for me. So growing up, what was interesting is doing theater, being on that route to having a career in finance. I remember that one very interesting thing happened from the ability of or I suppose the experience of being on stages was I got very good at playing a character. I became very good at being somebody who I wasn't. And people, other uh, Indians in my community would be like, Rav, you know what, man? Dude, you're like a coconut. I'm like, what do you mean? And they're like, bro, you're like, you're like brown on the outside, but white on the inside. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, uh, no, <laughs> no like, like an Oreo, you know, like an Oreo. And I was like, oh, okay. So, and, and I suppose in the cancel culture we live in today, now that would be like, oh my God, man, that's so offensive. But it was very interesting where what I was subconsciously doing, and I can look back in hindsight now, was, you know, craving acceptance and trying to really fit in taught me that, hey, man, play a character, you know, play a character, dude. And it led me to making some decisions in life, which I don't regret because, hey, it's all a part of our story. But it led me to do things often, which weren't always aligned with who I am, which then it attracts people, opportunities and things which aren't aligned with you. They're aligned with the character that you're playing. So eventually, man, I headed, headed into the world of investment banking, like you mentioned in the intro, quit that world in 2016. And here we are, brother. I'm with you now. 
That was very good. That was well beyond 30 seconds, though. Cool. <laughs> Thank you, coach. Thank you. <laughs> and for anyone who has no idea why I'm asking for this in 30 seconds, it's because this is this is a, the standing exercise you do with people where you, you ask them to tell you a story in 30 seconds, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so one of the interesting things is with a lot of clients who I work with, so yeah, definitely right, that was longer than 30. It was one of the things that I work with them with especially the entrepreneurs and consultants is when they say, oh, you know, Rav, I go to a networking event or, you know, I'm speaking and pitching my business at a live event and I'm asked the question, what do you do? They go to the classic, uh, well, you know, oh man, like, you know, that thing, like, okay, we're, we're in stealth mode. Like we're, we're in stealth mode, man. So I, it's like, we're, what? innovation <laughs> you know like innovation and, and they either do that or they do the classic we help biotech leaders achieve and it feels you know very very inauthentic so yeah one of the things and exercises that i like to do with individuals to start with before they even begin partnering with me on their journey of speaking and storytelling is seeing where they are in terms of their foundations with being able to tell an impactful story in 30 60 90 seconds whatever it could be and I've seen you do that exercise with the pictures behind you. And for anyone who's not watching mm. this on YouTube, which would be most people, uh, because most of my audience listens to this, you have three pictures behind you. Uh, one yeah. is uh, Mahatma Gandhi, the other is Muhammad Ali, and the other one is the third one is Bruce Lee. And I've seen you ask people, you know, there's these three blokes here, choose one and tell me a story about them. Yeah. Why do you do it? I don't know if you always do that, but when you do that, why do you have them do a story that is not a personal story? Why do you, is that a particular reason why you choose that? Or is it just because you have the visual aid right there? So three reasons. One is subconsciously, when you've entered this call with you and I, you've seen that in my background. So it's already registered. So for them, it's sometimes it's less of a shock a lot of the time. So number two is a borrowed story ultimately something that they've learned or something that they've seen or experienced about, you know, oh, I remember my dad told me about the first time he watched Enter the Dragon, whatever. It often creates distance from Francisco, Francisco and Francisco telling this specific story about somebody else. It's less anxiety there, less performance anxiety. They get out of their own head and they start realizing that, hey, this isn't as bad as I thought. So there is there is that element to it. And number three as well, it's just easier for me. <laughs> like, I don't have to go, so, you know, who's your favorite, you know, X, Y, Z? I'm like, listen, there's three dudes behind me, name them. They're like, ah, oh, bang, bang, bang. And uh, normally, I've never had anybody who's not got an interesting story or impactful moment that they've experienced about Bruce, uh, Gandhi, and Muhammad. I say Bruce, like... <laughs> You know, I've been texting him or whatever. But you, you know, you know, your, I mean. your mate. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Though. Your mate. What the hell is this thing? I have a. Uh... I have some some uh, some exchange bollocks popping up on my screen and making a lot of noise. I don't want an exchange password. Fuck off. <laughs> I have to add this. I, I didn't know what exchange bollocks was there for a second. I was like, dude, you better clear that cookie history before your wife sees it. Yeah, I, I, don't know what, well, I don't know what this nonsense is. Um, I'll just leave it there for now. Uh, anyway. Okay. Yeah, so... <clears throat> I agree, and I one of the things that that happens a lot with with storytelling that I don't think it was an issue when it was when it was with more public speaking type of uh, training is that is content, right? Because if you ask someone to tell you a personal story and you haven't told them to think about something before or prepare something, some people are just blank. You know, I find that if you if you ask someone, perhaps because they don't th understand what a story is, they don't quite get what is it that you mean when you say a story. A lot of people think of a story that you always tell or, or something you usually share with your friends. They wouldn't say just something that happened in your life. Um, so I found that a lot of people really struggle to just come up with something off the cuff if it's about them. If it's about an actor, if it's about a movie, it's about a story they heard, seems to be easier for them. At least that's been my experience. Yeah, I agree, man. And uh, yeah, going back to that point of sometimes a borrowed story, it creates less anxiety for the mind. It doesn't create the fight or flight response when you're under that high pressure moment. And it allows you to be a bit more freer with the way that you're sharing that impactful moment. But yeah, being mm. able to share, you know, if somebody said, like if you said at the beginning, if I said to you now, hey, 
or if you said to me, hey, tell me a story about Ghani or Bruce or whatever, mm. there is a specific way which can help relieve anxiety and also allow you to breed high levels of confidence um, where, with your audience. So for example, if, if, if I think about a wedding, I'm getting married in October, right? And if I tell my best man, I'm like, hey bro, listen, off the cuff, I'm like, uh, tell us a story about, you know what we did in 2007? He's like, uh, <laughs> You want me to okay. tell that one, Ryan? Are you sure? <laughs> okay. If he starts in a way, and a specific way and ends in a way which is congruent to the start of his story the audience don't know the script there is no script and it allows you to also feel confident and comfortable in the moment because you know this better than anybody stories can start a certain way and then they start going well and they just tailor off completely so for example if my best man was like ah oh, man i'd love to tell you about the time rav and i went to vegas in 2007 and then ended it with and that's the story about the time Rav and I went to Vegas in 2007. If he ends it at that point, the audience don't know any different and he comes across very refined. Yeah, I've, I've noticed that that anxiety some people have, which is that they they think the audience somehow can read their mind and know yeah. when, they, for example, they made the mistake. It's like, oh, no, I, I messed that up. It's like, nobody knows you messed that up. <laughs> it's like, and even, even even the fact that you messed it up is is kind of debatable. But uh, yeah. one of my friends has been doing this for a very long time. He always says, like, the last thing you ever want to do is to apologize for well, for anything, really, but particularly for something that it's probably in your head. Like no, no one knows you've that that story wasn't told perfectly, or that presentation didn't go exactly as planned. Um, so you know, just just plow through it. Even if you have made a mistake, people are just gonna shrug it off unless you brought their attention to it. Yeah, it's interesting, man. And I'd say I definitely subscribe to that belief to an extent. But if I think about, for example, the world of sales for a second, you know what I used to teach the reps on the sales floor would be if there's an objection that the audio, uh, the person on the other end of the phone has, for example, this costs too much or I don't have time right now by leading with that objection. It completely like, you know, the movie eight mile where he just uses at the end, B rabbit uses everything that could be used against him and just flips it into a, Hey, you've got nothing else on me. Sometimes it's a quite a nice way, I think, for people who are communicating when delivering a presentation or delivering their story. If they do have that imperfect moment, it's such a beautiful opportunity to create a connection. So those imperfect moments, actually, if you own it, it's the most charismatic thing in the entire world versus the people who are like, oh, okay, awkward, like you feel awkward for them watching them and oh, it's never a good look, you know? Yeah, no, I, I don't think we're talking about different things. I, I'm, I'm fully, as anyone who's ever read anything I wrote or watched any of my videos, I'm all for embracing the imperfect moments. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All I mean is, if you're telling a story, you're doing a presentation, and you, you sort of just forgot a little bit, right? You skipped a part of the presentation. Some people stop and go, oh, sorry, I, I forgot something. And then, and then they backtrack and they start trying to correct themselves. And often, mm -hmm. like I've, I remember delivering speeches, and and you know it was a comp speech competition. I actually won. And then afterwards, I'm like, e I forgot a whole chunk of that speech. And people are yeah. like, seemed like it just flowed one thing into the other. Oh, um, so that's what I mean. Yeah. It's 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 the it's no one knows that it's imperfect, if, even if there is such a thing as perfect, other yeah. than you. So yes. unless it's a massive thing and all of a sudden there makes no sense whatsoever because you left it out, you know, just yeah. plow through. Um, and, and often, you know, as, as you know more than I will, I think, because you've done a lot, lots of other types of performance on stage, <clears throat> there is some amount of vulnerability in, in you being nervous or you making mistakes that endears yeah. you to the audience. Totally, man. Yeah, I agree with you on that, uh, especially on the first part. Actually, now that you've put it like that, it's it's true, man. The audience don't know. They don't know any different. But it's like in life, we expect things to go in a specific way. You know, I think our you know mutual friend Asuka, he said this once and I was like, oh, man, I love that. He said, listen, life isn't perfect. So your presentation shouldn't be either. And I'm like, oh, that's a that's a dope way of putting it. Uh, but yeah, what you said, what was the second thing you said? Oh, yeah, about performances. Yeah, man, it's, it's really interesting, especially theater taught me that, you know, what you specifically mentioned there is somebody who's seeing it 
with fresh eyes for the first time in their life, I remember there would be times where I would forget a chunk and I wouldn't mention it. And then I would just move on to the next bit. But the, and I would be like, oh man, I can't believe I missed that. Like what a fool. But th they would come back and they'd be like, man, that was, that was amazing. I'm like, oh yeah, because obviously it's the first time you're seeing it. So it's really, really interesting point. And I think the self-awareness and the deep work you've got to do as your you know, inner work in yourself to get to that point is very important as well, which I think one big thing that's missed in the world that we both operate in. Mm. Yeah, I, I had a very interesting alternative look at this subject we're talking about when I, I, I fell into a YouTube hole uh, watching this channel from, from, the, from a, um, a London woman called Bath Roars, and she's a, a vocal okay. coach. Yeah, okay, I don't cool. know if Roars is her surname, but that's what she goes by, Bath Roars. Okay, cool. And uh, she's a Scottish, has a lovely accent, and then she, she analyzes vocal performances from artists. So yeah. she was, I think it was Pearl Jam's Black on the acoustic. And, and a lot of the time she's saying how he didn't quite hit the note or, or he, you know, he repeated a line out of place and something. And, and at some point, you know, her, his facial expressions and the way his voice sort of acknowledges that there was a mistake. And she talks about it, that how all of that adds up to the performance and the story he's telling, because the, mm -hmm. the character in the song is going through a lot of turmoil. And then yeah. the performer reflects that to some way by not yeah. having a pitch perfect performance. And I thought yeah. it was really interesting because I, I hadn't really thought of, to me, it was also, well, it's the lyrics and it's how well you sang it. I, I didn't quite get that if you're kind of messing up or looking nervous as a sing, as a singer, that will actually that could actually add to the performance. But it's definitely true when you are on stage. Yeah, man, definitely. And I think one of the interesting things, especially when you're delivering, is it if it's your story as an entrepreneur or if you're an executive, salesperson, whatever it might be, is is the parts of your story which are vulnerable. If I said, hey, and then I struggled with depression, you're like, okay, that's just weird. Like it, it, it completely just is a, is a breeding ground for disconnection, but really embodying those nerves and then showcasing the transformation through your voice, your eyes, everything from who you were at stage one versus who you were at the end is super important man so i can imagine as a singer as well it's, it's just uh that's a completely different ball game and if i would if i could sing i'd be on x factor bro like i would be like i'd be queuing up to the auditions definitely but uh, i'm a horrendous singer but uh that is a different skill and art in itself man so kudos to those individuals yeah true i i cannot sing to save my life and and my my four-year-old for the moment cannot sing to save her life but she really yeah. thinks she can i'm at that stage where you you need to be positive, encourage whatever they want to do. Oh, but sure. hopefully don't do all day long at the, at the <laughs> top of her lungs. Yeah, <laughs> it's, yeah. it's finding those skillful ways of saying it's lovely and you should definitely put your heart and soul into it. But can you not do it after seven o'clock in the <laughs> afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's tough, dude. That's like the, the, the part of how honest do you be in that moment? That's a dilemma. That is a real dilemma. Yeah. Well, listen, one of the reasons why I, I said yes to, to doing the show today with very little prep or normally right, yeah. I do prepare a ton of stuff. Yeah. But this has been helped by, by you, by your approach to storytelling, because this is something yeah. I've battled with from time to time, which is that I, so, so I think there's two things you can do with stories. And a story can be definitely a skill. I've called it a language sometimes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's also a tool. And I, I'm at the moment sort of in the fence and doing a little bit of both things, but you have clearly gone down the tool approach. So yes. you're not you you're not talking to people about I'm gonna make you a better, hey, I'm gonna teach you how to use stories in all these different areas. You have the one thing you're teaching people, which is their signature story that convert, you know, what they use in presentations and podcasts and lives that converts. Yeah customers so sure. so i thought you know i i could dive deep and come up with a million different things that we could talk about but yeah you yeah. you don't talk about a million things so i thought it would be really you know being focused and saying okay well let's dig into that thing yeah because that that is what you do really 
right? Oh, or the yeah. other stuff is yeah. just, you know, we can shoot the shit, but what you really focus on and what you do for your clients is is that. So yeah. So the first thing I, I the first question I wanted to ask you there is what do you find is is the one thing that that your client, that anyone trying to use a signature story in a, in a sales environment, well, actually, can you just define that first? Because you're going to define that better than I probably did. The signature yeah. story. Signature story. Yeah. My perspective is is one repeatable story that you've carefully crafted for your business that presents your mission and expertise in a way that connects and converts. So that's how I look at it, Matt. In in the world, like you said rightly at the beginning of using it as the most powerful marketing tool for your business. Yeah, and I and, and it's, I think it's interesting because that differentiates it from, say, my approach, for example. So in my in my course, I have I talk about three signature stories. So there's yeah. the origin, yeah. the origin story, which is not a yeah. sales story. It's like you don't yeah. tell that to sell. You usually tell that to connect to people and for them yeah. to know who you are in a much more interesting way than 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 a bio or something like that. Um, I talk about a help story, which a lot of people call a success story or a value story, and the expert story. So the way yeah. I understand your signature story, in a sense, it's those three things in one. Yeah, you make a really good point, man, because there is there's different types of signature stories, quote unquote, that you could share throughout, you know, the buyer's journey. Like you said, you know, the help story, the origin story, all these good stuff. For me, I specifically focus, I suppose, on the brand signature story. And I suppose specifically for consultants as well, where in that world that you and I operate in, where people really do buy into people. You know, I've worked for companies before where CEOs preferred to remain completely faceless. And it was because they were selling a product which was highly transactional in a way. And it, it had a different type of storytelling, the corporate stuff, which I don't think anyone Re resonates with corporate storytelling and you know the fluff it's also I, I think it's called crap storytelling that's really what yeah, it I've is heard of that technical yeah. term yours yes, <laughs> yes, it, yes. It is, it, it's, it's the classic stuff where and i've been a victim of this before you know before i started on linkedin back in march i look at what i used to share and it was absolute dribble like it was just it was so it was just completely different to, to how I show up on this platform now versus other platforms. But you, I digress. You were, but yeah. you were a professional, Ra. You were being professional, Ra. Yeah, exactly. It's being professional. Professional. Yeah. <laughs> the corporate jargon and the corporate voice. Uh, and yes. yeah, so it's, it's a good point, man. But to go back to the original question, yeah. So specifically, I focus on the brand signature story. Yeah. Okay. So what would you say is... I don't know if you can boil it down that much, but but yeah. if there's one thing that that story needs to do, if if you had to get one thing right in that story, perhaps not get the rest as right. What is the one thing that that story needs to do? Connect. Period. Connect for me anyway. So the, for the way I think about it is, you cannot convert without connection. But connection alone won't guarantee conversion. Now, I had a mentor once um, that I worked with last year, actually, a guy called Scott Oldford, a really good guy. And he sp speaks about something called the SSF method. And he says, well, your prospects are at different stages in their journey. You've got somebody who's on the sidewalk, okay, of the SSF method, who's like, listen, man, I don't know who Rav and who Francisco is. I don't even know if I've got a problem. So you pitching me right now is going to do nothing. It's just going to feel icky. But then you've got the person who's in the slow lane. They're like, okay, I know I've got a problem, but I just don't know if you have the right vehicle to help me solve it. I need to do a little bit more work here. And then the fast lane is, is I've got an itch. I need to scratch it. So, you know, the connection part is important because it will just simply organically nurture somebody to the next stage of the buyer's journey, wherever they are. So one important question about connection would be for me, yeah. connection to who exactly connection to you as the as the the service provider as the brand person as the the, the consultant or connection to the people you help or, yeah or good both. point yeah man really good point so three things a connection to the individual themselves because like you said at the beginning if two companies have the same 
same service or two consultants have the same service, but the, their unique story is what people are buying into. People are going to be like, man, I only want Francisco to solve my problem because I really resonated with bang, whatever it could be. So the consultant themselves, then number two would be their mission and who they're actually solving that problem for. So a lot of the time consultants will share a story, but it hits the mark. It misses the mark rather because they're trying to be liked by everybody versus trying to specifically talk to and solve a problem for one person. And then the final part, which is very, very important as well, is their why and their mission and why they're doing what they're doing. Because somebody can sense, you know, the internet marketers of the world where it often gets a bad name and you know they're just doing it for the Lambo. Like, you know, that's all they're doing it for, right? So what is the why? What is the anchor behind it? And I think those three things are super important. I'm actually having next week, I'm having a guy on the podcast called Kendall Haven. I don't know if you're familiar oh, cool. with him. Yeah. So, so for anyone who doesn't know, Kendall Haven has been around forever. He wrote uh, Story Smart, which is one of the most reference, reference books when it comes to talking about the science of storytelling. And he was actually the guy in the lab telling stories, changing little bits of the stories where people were connected to, to um, uh, MRI machines. And, and one of the things he said that, I mean, it's kind of obvious, but I had never thought of it that way until I read it in his book, is he said that one of the, the most impactful things you can do to change the audience's perception of a story is change the motive of the main character. So yeah. He says you can have yeah. two people trying to do the yeah. exact same thing. Like I'm trying yeah. to, I don't know, teach my, ch my child to, to swim but you can be doing it because you're a loving parent, maybe because you lost someone for dr to, to drowning or because yeah. you're a controlling asshole that refuses to have a child that doesn't swim very well because you're a swimming champion. And all of a sudden yes. you've gone from a, you know, a compassionate person that I want to stand behind to a yeah. complete douche that I don't want to have anything to do with. And, and that, that is the why, really. Exactly. Yeah. It's exactly that way. I love what you said about the controlling parent, because we've all been there where you're playing sport as a kid and you've got that parent going, Jimmy, run faster. And it's because they didn't make it as a sprinter when they were 12 and they're trying to channel their dreams into somebody who just wants to play chess. Right. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's fascinating, man. Exactly. It's the it's the motive. It's the anchor. It's the why. And people really buy into that. What is the controlling idea behind what you're doing? It's super important. And would you say that 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 you just said about how they were trying to, in a sense, speak to everyone and, and connect to everyone, is that the biggest mistake that you find that people make when they're trying to do any type of presentation that looks like a signature story? Yes, but I would say it actually stems from, dude, in my opinion, is so many people are often scared of sharing certain stories that would serve their ideal client because they're actually scared it would drive away their ideal client. I'll give you an example. I delivered this presentation. The CEO stands up and he says, listen, man, I run a wealth management practice. Here's the truth. Uh, you speak about being vulnerable, but the truth is, is if I talk about the fact that I struggle with debt for 15 years, why would somebody want to hire me? And it was very interesting where actually that is the one story which is going to allow you to connect with your ideal client. But by not sharing it and speaking about the fact that you worked at Cisco or like, you know, you know, Citibank or Bank of America for 20 years, no one cares. No, it's a laundry list. No one cares. So it's interesting. It's we omit the things that will make us more human in the eyes of our ideal client. And instead we pick something general, which just goes in one ear and out the other. Well, and it can be even worse than that, which is that if the clients you're talking about need help because they struggle with something, you know, who, who are you more likely to ask for help uh, from? You know, the, the person who says, no, I never had that problem, but I'm sure we can figure it out. Doesn't sound that complicated. Yeah. Or the person yeah. goes, man, I struggle with that for years. And yeah. this is what I did that got me out of that hole. And it's like, okay, fine. Like one, you sound like a nicer person <laughs> to you're, you're, yeah. you've been where I am now when you can help me out. Uh, because if, if the people you're trying to serve have no problem that they could identify with whatever struggles you went through in the past, then yeah. you know, you're not going to sell them anyway. 100%, 100%, man. It's so true. And I think we're often, like I said, scared to share the things that really humanizes us. And a, a great guy called Pat Quinn, 
talks about this concept of being extraordinary in the eyes of your ideal client is the ordinary is being human, but the extra is, okay, how many people have really climbed Mount Everest? If you're just sharing the extra, not many people can relate to that. But if you're just ordinary, then people are like, well, I'm just like you. Maybe I should be up there teaching. I don't know. So you need to be human, but also somebody of value who's a, maybe a few steps ahead of your ideal client and can solve a problem for them. Yeah, and the, the the I think I've seen you talk about this as the Mount Everest problem, and it, yeah. we all use Everest as the example because it's such an obvious bad yeah. story yeah, for man. most people, which yeah. is that it's just not relatable. So whatever you're yeah. going to talk about, if people can see themselves doing that, like now, yeah. um, then you're creating a barrier. That doesn't mean that they couldn't think, oh, I could be the type of person that climbs Everest. But uh, if you're speaking sure. to a whole bunch of people that are struggling with, I don't know, obesity. Maybe your climb, you know, climbing Mount Everest is not the relatable story you want to choose right at this moment because yeah. it's so far away from the reality that they're gonna go, well, you know, you're the type of guy who runs Iron Man's, so like, you know, who, like, you, you're not, you're not my people. Um, so yeah, dude, exactly, exactly, man. And you mentioned a really good point, which is if I'm speaking to a room of people who have a six pack and want an eight pack the gap between where they are now and where they want to be is different to the gap of somebody who's severely obese and needs to lose 50 pounds in whatever. So the type of story you will share will also connect to them differently. And going back to the beginning, if you don't know who you're speaking to, your story, your pop culture references, the, you know, the, the way you show up, will appeal to different people differently. So it's really subtle, but it can be the difference between success and failure, however you define that. And now you say that, I, I realize that the market is, is sorely lacking. Someone tried to address people that have a two-pack with the right <laughs> lighting and uh, are looking for a four-pack. I think that is an underserved audience out there. Someone, yeah, someone should jump on that. <laughs> someone needs to jump on that market for sure. But yeah, like, like you said, man, there's a lot of people in even like the fitness space, man. Like I think about the personal trainer that you know I'm working with now. The reason why I chose him was the results that he got for a friend of mine. And I was like, oh my God, wow. So he didn't actually win me over through his story, but he won me over through what you would call, I suppose, is the help story of how he supported somebody else. I saw the results and I was like, dude, I'm getting married in October. I need me some of that, you know? So yeah. Well, and you, and you, also, fat. You, you might also suffer from this thing that, that, that I'm sure no one listening to this podcast ever suffered from, which is that secretly, you think you are the fittest, best looking of all your friends. And then one of the guys takes a shirt off and you go, oh man, that is screwing up my narrative. I, I need to get my, my personal trainer game on. <laughs> this is not okay. Dude, this is the level of delusion that I have, right? So the, he, he, he says to me, okay, I've got, a, I've got a few pictures behind me, Rav. Which one do you say you look like right now? And there was a guy who was jacked and cut. I was like, bro, I'm like that guy. And he goes, are you sure? I was like, yeah. He goes, just send me a pictures, you know, for your foundational level. I looked at it and I was like, I'm an idiot. Like, <laughs> I look nothing like that jacked, cut or ripped small guy. So high levels of delusion, but hey, I see it as a good thing. <laughs> we got we got into this conversation out of my my usual nonsense, but I, I had an experience with that that I think a lot of people have when it comes to to their story and figuring out what parts of yeah. the story they should use. Which is, you know, a, a while back, a few years ago, I, I decided that I was going to get jacked, right? And and I I figured oh, I need to lose some weight, get rid of some of that body fat and stuff. Yeah. And I started yeah. losing weight, and I normally run at around eighty one kilos or something like that, you know, one hundred and sixty nice. pounds, give or take. Yeah. And I went down all the way to about, I don't know, 71, 72. And yeah. I genuinely thought I looked great. And my friends kept saying, May, you look sick. What's wrong with you? <laughs> like, and, you know, like, you look so thin. You, you look yeah. like you're just recovering some, from some very, you know, bad disease. And wow. I'm like, nah, you, 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 I don't know what you're talking about. And, um, you know, what do you with your beer belly know about this stuff? And yeah. then, and then eventually I kind of, realized that that was definitely the case and then now when yeah. i look at pictures i i go i was so thin like and i just wow. could not see it and yeah. i think we people use this expression you're talking about why people struggle to you know you make websites but you can make your own website you help people yeah. figure out their brand but you can't figure out your own and you help people tell their story it's really hard to figure out your own 
because we are which are close to it we're inside the bottle whatever the expression is which leads me to an actual question which which is what process or processes do you find you get more success from when it comes to figuring out what parts of people's story should fit into that narrative you know what what are there two or three questions that you find about well, this ones usually get me what i want or you know yeah. what what's the approach <clears throat> yeah good question man so i have a proprietary process called the sumo method now why sumo is the key philosophy which underpins sumo wrestling is purification. And what I stand for is I'm purifying the consultant's message to really impact one specific person. So if we look at the S part, it's solidifying your perfect audience avatar, which we've spoken about, who are you speaking to? Then it's unlocking your unique story. So using what I call the story extraction process is there is a specific series of these questions which i will ask i think it's about 49 of them which are very very structured in a way whereby okay if your ideal client wants to feel a specific way and you want to evoke a specific feeling which will translate into a thought which will then provoke action okay if you want somebody to feel less anxiety and relief well, you sharing a story about how you sold your company or I don't know, sold your company for a billion dollars might be right. But actually, only if you felt less anxiety and relief that, oh, my God, thank God I'm not responsible for all these people, blah, 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 blah. So what's interesting is figuring out how you want your ideal client to feel think and act on your message and then marrying up that with all of the different memories successes and failures that you've had and finding a blend which really will be impactful and resonate with your ideal client what does what do the m and the o stand for so m is then methodically crafting your brand signature story and then the o is oozing confidence as you share your message with the world so then that's on the delivery part of things which you know for example a lot of people in our space are so great at like yourself and so many people not only understand okay the story is one part of it but you can have the greatest script in the world you know i remember i used those sales reps and they would be like hi it's james here from and they're like it's the script it's not the script in my opinion, anyway, it's not the script. It's how you are embodying that script. The greatest things in the world have been scripted. I loved, you know, all the different movies in Hollywood that I've watched a million times, like Limitless. Get, well, guess what? It's scripted. So the delivery for me is very important. And I don't think enough people focus on that. All right. So first, I appreciate and, and uh, respect the fact that you managed to get oozing into the acronym of your proprietary process. It felt good. I was like, it felt good. Much respect, bro. Um, <laughs> two, yeah, I think it's cool that you mentioned Limitless. And I've, I've, I know that this is a movie you like a lot. Yeah. But I, I, I wonder if a lot of people get very disappointed when they realize that them getting good at this stuff, them being able to deliver their their signature story or get better at telling stories yeah it's not yeah. like limitless it's not like you haven't taken a drug and all of a sudden within a few days you are this magical being that can essentially achieve everything you know the reality is a lot less glamorous than that and it requires a whole lot more hard work than that bro you, it's like think about if somebody asked you how you got started, the truth is you probably got started at like six years old, seven years old, you didn't even know it. It's like you've been Mr. Miyagi throughout your entire life and now it's come to fruition. And I think the thing is, is even when I take on a new skill, I'm like, oh, okay, if I do this, that, or the other, like golf, I took up golf with my dad and I was like, I am so distinctly average. I wish I had started like 15, 20 years ago. It would have been so much better. So I think we need to realize that it's a skill there are no magic bullets, but the truth is, is that with every day putting in the reps, going back to what we said about the six pack, you will get the six pack. But if you just think about doing the reps with zero execution and zero accountability, well, there'll be no world for us because that's what we do, right? Mm. Yes, hundred uh, percent. It's I've I've used this this analogy before where where I consider story to be to be a language. So if you want to be yeah. very, very good at it, you need to immerse yourself in it. You need to practice it a lot. Having said that, like a language, if you learn it well enough, you can get directions, you can get yeah. a beer, or you can get yourself out of trouble. So yeah. to a lot of people, that's that's all you're trying to do. 
and some of some of them will stop there. They're like, okay, I this one gets me directions or a beer out of trouble every time. I don't need yeah. anything else. And some people go, actually, I'm not getting all the the, the power out of this skill that I could get. I mm-hmm. want to get better at it. Sure. So 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 there's that as well. I think you don't need what you don't need the skill to use the tool. At least you need some amount of the skill to use the tool. Um, mm. But you can use you have many more tools if you actually develop the skill past a certain point. At least it's been uh, that's been my experience. Yeah. Um, and and one so one one other question when it comes to finding those. I oh, know two things. First, how much you find that in order to answer the questions, your forty nine questions, yeah. a lot of people have to spend a whole lot of time actually figuring out what the answers are because if you i i think my my experience is if you ask people like what do you want your ideal first they don't know who their ideal clients are you know the your yeah. perfect uh audience avatar or, or however you call yeah. it they don't know that and yeah like they, they never thought it was like wow what do i want that person who i don't know to feel like so how much of those questions are the answer is that the first answer is I have absolutely no idea what this question means, and how yeah. much of that is just like, oh, actually, no, I actually know what you're asking me. Yeah, good point. Uh, yeah, and I think the interesting thing is, is a lot of people, for example, will learn best when they're writing. If you ask me to write, dude, like writing sales copy or just writing copy is way more painful than doing a video for me. It's just, it takes me a lot longer. It's a skill that I'm constantly trying to get better at. But for me, I'll put up a video, shoot a quick selfie video and it's out. It's very different for me. So if I'm looking at myself, looking at those questions, I was like, well, actually, I would just prefer to whack on a video and just roll through them and then just have it transcribed. So I tell my clients the same thing, you know, people will process information in a different way. So for a lot of them, for example, they'll go through it in video form, some of them will want to write. It really depends. And also what I really, really promote is progress over perfection. So if in that moment, you can only, uh, you, nothing's coming to mind, that's totally cool. Move on, move on, move on to the next thing, move on to the next thing and come back. But before I actually do that, what I start teaching them and priming them for is finding stories in their day-to-day life. So for seven days, what they have to do is at the end of every day, say 9 p.m., they say, okay, what was a specific moment which happened? With 1,440 minutes in a day, there are moments, there are stories everywhere, but we're like, oh man, going back to the Everest effect, this isn't worthy, this isn't good enough. So teaching them that stories are all around us to then get them ready for finding these moments throughout their life. So going micro and then looking at the macro. So it depends on the person, man. You know, it really depends on the person, which is a really yeah. cop-out answer, but it's just the truth. No, it is, I don't think there's one size fits all for any of these things. And and this yeah. process which you, that you tell them to do for seven days is something I've now been doing for... 82 days which oh, is uh, I, got, I think i got this really? from i got this from a, a storyteller that i always talk about called matthew dix and he calls this homework for life uh yeah. which is, and, and he says there's this amazing things that happen is once you get into the habit of looking for that moment you start noticing as it happens not at the end yeah. of the day you go oh this is it this is my story yeah. for t-. like if i had to tell a story this would be it for today uh, it jogs the memory and stories from your past sort of come rushing back that yeah. you're like, oh, I hadn't thought about this in years, and all of a sudden it's back. Mm. Uh, and and there's also this really cool thing which I haven't tried it yet, but I believe him yeah. when he says is that because of the way we remember stories, if a year down the line you look at your diary or spreadsheet or whatever you're using to record these things, and you look at those three four words that are meant to jog your memory about a story, you remember that day. So you yeah. go. Oh yeah, that's that day we did this and we did that, and which is something I think a lot of people get with pictures, yeah. but but it, it is a different angle to approach it. Um, and when you're picking those moments to go into the story, do you yeah. find that I, I think most people naturally would want to use something that is professional and yeah. not something that is personal? Do you find that there is one type or other that that? works better or it just very much depends on on the client and their experiences yeah it's a good question i think it depends on two things one is who they're serving really who they're serving and two is is 
where they're at in their journey of feeling comfortable to share their story. Because I think in the world we live in, man, everyone thinks authenticity is, I need to show you my dog. I need to show you me on the toilet. I need to show you everything. But the way I like to view it is, is being open with the parts of your life that you are willing to show, but being 100% open about those parts. So you get to select those. It's not as if you have to show everything. And I think a lot of the time, people are just looking for permission. They're looking for somebody to go, you know what? I love this. I really feel like this could resonate. I want you to go test it. And then the truth is go deliver it 50 times, go practice it 50 times. And you'll realize, you know what? That didn't resonate, but we need data more than anything. We need data. And I think people fear they get stuck in this thought loop where they think, okay, I need to think about this more because then that will give me the clarity I need to know if this actually works. When realistically, the only way to get more clarity is action, putting that story out there in front of your ideal client and getting the feedback. Do people exchange their stories? Do they talk about the specific moment or are they like, yeah, you were, you were really confident. Yeah, well done. You're the man. But you know, that's, that's really doesn't, doesn't pay the bills. That doesn't create the impact that we want. It doesn't really move the needle forward in the long run. Yeah, I guess that, you know, this is something I also seen you talk about when you when you shared uh, a framework for presentations, uh, which yeah. I think was, you know, punchline story analogy. Yeah. yeah. And and I think the analogy is, the, is an interesting part there because in many ways, the story can be the analogy. So if, the, if you're using mm. a personal story, you almost certainly trying to use it either to show something about yourself to the audience or yeah. as an analogy. Now, mm. the analogy does sometimes can feel very forced. And this is where I think people are, people that are not very good at storytelling do all the time. It's like, uh, you know, I was trying to fix my sink and I didn't, I didn't know how to do it. So I called the plumber. See, it's very important to call for help when you don't know what you're doing. You know, I mean, you can, you can probably get a good story out of that if you flooded the house. But but most people won't. They would just make this type of little analogy and they think they're using the power of storytelling where it's kind of, you know, shoehorned in to to, to give it a little bit of color. Um, But... But I think that that's that's the thing that people struggle with sometimes is, you know, if you are trying to show yourself as a successful consultant and the type of people you help, it's I think it's difficult that none of your story talks about some of the stuff you do professionally or the people that you help. It, it will look strange if it has nothing professional in it. I, yes, I, to- totally. Is in, for example, if the start of your story is about a moment that happened when you were a child, which made you realize that knowledge is power, for example, and that realistically the execution is king or queen or whatever it is. And then you talk about how, you know, when you first landed in Bank of America, you were getting all of this knowledge, you were struggling with InfoBC, you were lacking execution. It ties up to what you're doing professionally, but also just telling a story for story's sake, and it simply not adding any business value is a problem because then they're like, well, what's your unique mechanism to solve my problem? One, two is, is do I even believe you can solve it? And three, where's your credibility stock? Throughout that story, people should be bought into you, your product and your company really. And that should be like rising throughout your story and presentation. And yeah, if you don't add business value in the world we live in today, it's just a campfire story. Yes, and it's why I don't think I would ever advise any of my clients to do some of the stuff I do on social media, like share stories when I was in the middle of gay pride in Madrid. That works so well for you. (laughs) That's the thing. This is is the beautiful thing, man, is like, for example, your personality and the way you show up is so, but it's, it's so unique to you. Like you can't teach somebody how to be them. Well, you, you, I suppose you can't teach them, but you can guide them. And that's the thing that trumps anything, right? You know that better than anybody. Like I look at Kevin Hart, I love him. And I'm like, man, like forget technicalities. It just, I'm a, I'm a, you're a magnet, bro. And it's like, for example, when people really like yourself with the way you tell stories, the way you show up on video, the way you show up on different parts of uh, when you're writing text, telling somebody to do exactly that for them is like the worst advice. It's like, that may not work for you. Yeah, you know, it's it's, and, and I don't think anybody else should. I, I shouldn't try and create another Francisco. I think one is more than enough, but it's it's just not. You know, it 
it's as you said, it's a pur- purification proce- process. Yes. So there's the there is that thing I forgot to say Rodeau or whatever. It's like how do you sculpt this? Wow, I just get rid of everything that is not the sculpture. Mm-hmm. I just get yeah. rid of everything that is not. And and I think often the, the process of people finding themselves and finding their voice in business or in social media, or whatever, is what is it that is really you? And it might is it's not just that, but it might, in my case, might be the sense of humor, might be the specific types of stories that I share. Once get rid of everything else that's not there. Like no one cares if I'm, I don't know, love spreadsheets. That that's not really relevant for for the person I'm showing up as on social media. So get rid of everything that is not really you. And you get a boiled out essence of what it is you. And you can add all the other stuff, but people should recognize you for you. Like right. a, a piece of text or video that you put out and I like the voice distorted, I would listen and it was like, that that's probably Ravi because I'm getting the changes of voice. He's yeah, doing his voices. Yeah. He's probably moving around a bit theatrically there. That would yeah. never be me. And yeah. I think that's kind of the important thing is you should be you and no one should confuse you for anyone else. And if you've gotten there, I think you've kind of gotten your story sorted out. Yeah, I think, yeah, dude, like, just like perfectly put, it's just that you can't, you can't just beat somebody being comfortable in their own skin. It's just like, period, you just can't beat that. True, true. And on that note, I realize we are, you're almost on time for your, your other call you need to jump to. I've, I've still got six minutes, bro. So we can keep going. I was like, I've still got seven. Well, no, seven is, is, the, is that this, this fancy technology that we now use with video requires a few minutes for everything to be oh, uploaded. Yeah, yeah. Saying, so oh, so yeah, we, we better yeah. not cut it too close. Um, right. So anyone wants to, to, to learn more about the stuff you're doing, obviously they can connect with you on LinkedIn. That would be the most obvious yeah. place. Is there anyone anywhere else you want people to have to check you out? Yeah, man, you know what? LinkedIn is the main place where I hang out right now. So yeah, send me a connection request. Obviously, give uh, Francisco a like and a comment on this on this specific post and tell us what you found the most impactful. And yeah, just connect with me. And yeah, look forward to seeing how I could support you if I can, but moreover, hearing your story. In less per- than 30 seconds. <laughs> In less than 30 seconds, yes. <laughs> Perfect, man. I'm, I'm, I'm glad we did this. I don't think the lack of preparation will particularly show. Um, perhaps we wouldn't have gotten not. to some of the nonsense we got to, but, you know, that is really what we're here for. Stories yeah, are just the exactly. excuse. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, bro. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Take care of yourselves.